Hello, good evening. Welcome, welcome. We're very excited to see everyone coming in for Epicure's April clinical webinar. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Seeing familiar names. We're very happy and honored to have you here with us this evening um, with our esteemed host, Zachary Breeding, who is presenting The Many Faces of Exocrine Pancreatic Insufficiency, a review of cancer, cystic fibrosis, and pancreatitis. As you will all know, dietitians play an essential role in managing the nutrition status in all areas of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, specifically oncology and cystic fibrosis. During this webinar, Zachary will examine the role of the dietitian as the first point of evaluation for the patient prior to diagnosis and as a core player on the care team for oncology and cystic fibrosis patients. He will discuss the signs, associated symptoms, and ways these diseases can present nutritionally, as well as consequent dietary interventions for EPI patients. Before we begin, I have some housekeeping and introductions. First of all, hey, hi everybody, I'm Jamie. I'm Epicured's VP of Network Development and Strategy, uh, and I am honored to be your host this evening. Um, and now to the housekeeping. Uh, you'll all be on mute for the duration of the webinar, but Zachary would be happy to answer any questions that you have at the end of the presentation. You can submit those questions at any time through the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom panel. We are recording the session and we'll be following up with all of you who are attending live with the CPE certificate uh, via email. So please keep an eye on your inboxes for that. And with the housekeeping out of the way, it's my pleasure to give you a brief introduction of Epicured. Uh, we work with an incredibly engaged and outcomes-driven cadre of clinicians like all of you. We're very proud of our partnerships, many of which you can see um, on the presentation here. And we partner with them to bring these doctors and dietitians evidence-based nutrition. We bring it to life through beautiful and delicious meals specifically tailored for those living with IBS, Crohn's, colitis, SIBO, celiac, and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Uh, we know this can be really complicated, but we try to make it easy because it works. We have 15 years of research showing the efficacy of the low FODMAP diet. How do we make it easy? First and foremost, we know that there can be a lot of procedures and difficulty trying to get a diagnosis or um, some questions around whether or not you want to discuss the complicated uh, low FODMAP kind of restrictions and regimens. So by providing a few days of elimination phase friendly low FODMAP food through Epicured, that can provide some diagnostic direction before further in-depth education or invasive procedures. All of our food is prepared and ready to eat. Um, so it takes all of the stress out of figuring out what you can and cannot have. And it is a subscription service. It can be modified or canceled at any time, but our patients tell us they really appreciate the peace of mind knowing that food that makes them feel good is going to arrive on their doorstep each week. And finally, extremely importantly, is nutritional adequacy. Options for a variety of plant-based meals, um, Ensure that your patients who are following restricted diets have nutritional adequacy for all of the many macro micronutrients that typically can be lacking on a low FODMAP diet. So we know education is really important. That's why we're hosting all of you this evening. Uh, we wanna make sure you're getting access to the world's experts on all topics related to GI and beyond. Um, and we wanna help you educate your patients as well in ways that make low FODMAP fun and easy and streamlined. So there are lots of resources available to you. Uh, for those of you who are partners in health, which is that cadre of referring clinicians, there's no commitment, it's free to join, and um, you can get access to all of these resources, including the recording of this evening at our Partners in Health portal. And you'll get a link to that via email. So again, keep an eye out for that. And finally, why do we get out of bed every day at Epicured? It really is these testimonials from the people who tell us that 
the way that they eat has improved and they've gotten breakthroughs by eating epicured food. Um, telling us as a lifesaver truly makes my day and working with clinicians like you who um, are that conduit between patients who need our food um, is beyond gratifying. So thank you for all of you for your time, um, for your expertise and for the great work that you do with your patient communities. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's presenter, Zachary Breeding, MS, RDN, CSO, LDN, FAND, um, quite the expert, a registered licensed dietitian and holds his certification of specialty in oncology nutrition. That's the CSO I referenced. He's the owner of Sage Nutritious Solutions, a personalized nutrition and private chef company. And he is the food systems dietitian at the VA Medical Center. He is the recent recipient of the Emerging Leader in Dietetics Award from the Pennsylvania Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. No surprise, he's a rock star. And he's also the incoming speaker for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics House of Delegates and past chair of the Committee for Lifelong Learning. That committee plans the Food and Nutrition Conference and Expo. Um, what a fun time. Man, do I hope we get to do that in person together again soon. And Zachary is also the founder and president of the Maggie Wagner Foundation and the nonprofit organization with the mission to improve the lives of those living with cystic fibrosis. As a reminder, please submit your questions at any time in the Q&A panel below for conversation and Q&A at the end of the presentation. And with that, Zachary, I will let you take it from here. Fabulous. Thank you so, so much for that introduction. And uh, I'm really, really happy to be here talking to everybody about something that I'm really, really passionate about, which is EPI. Um, you know, us dietitians, we have our our things that we geek on, and this is definitely something that I like to geek on. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. We'll be discussing um, the many faces of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, which is a review of cancer, cystic fibrosis, and pancreatitis. A few disclosures about myself, just so you know what I'm all about. So um, I am the food systems dietitian at the Denver VA Medical Center. I am the developer of the CSO study guide and the MVW complete formulation probiotic, which is um, a design specifically for people with cystic fibrosis, but not solely provided to those with cystic fibrosis. Um, as Jamie stated, I'm the president of the Mandy Wagner Foundation, which is a nonprofit foundation that uh, provides opportunities to anyone with cystic fibrosis who wants to live out their dreams, whatever that might be. I am the co-founder of the CFN DMNT DPG subunit. Could I have said any more acronyms? And I'm the previous speaker um, for Allergan, which offers the pancreatic enzyme Zenpep and the previous brand ambassador for their Live to Thrive program. Our objectives for this evening are to explain the various etiologies of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, to be able to determine uh, patient symptoms, uh, consistent with a diagnosis of EPI and discuss MNT recommendations for those with EPI. So just a quick review of the pancreas. I know we all took anatomy and physiology, um, but the pancreas is responsible for digestion, absorption, and macronutrient metabolism, among many, many other things. Um, the main two functions are endocrine and exocrine. The endocrine function is involved in the release of glucagon and insulin to help manage blood sugar levels. And the exocrine function helps to release pancreatic enzymes, uh, amylase, uh, lipase, and proteases. So <clears throat> EPI here uh, in the diagram to the right, you can see how um, in this state, um, fibrosis and calcification has caused uh, a reduced or inappropriate secretion of pancreatic juices and its enzymes, which are the amylase, the lipase, and the various proteases. But, you know, lipase in particular, because that's the one that we're going to really focus on as we move forward uh, this evening. Also bicarbonate. Um, EPI is also characterized by the presence of maldigestion and malabsorption of nutrients, which we'll get into later on. Um, which is obviously because um, there's not enough um, of enzyme activity of, of functionality here. Um, it's also characterized at, um, at an output of less than 10% of that 
uh, necessary for normal digestion. It, it should be noted here though, that no one is 100%. Um, you know, the average person has about 92 to 98% of pancreatic functionality. So it's not like we're all starting out at 100% here. Losing 10% of that is what can start showing symptoms of EPI, but we'll get deeper into that uh, moving forward. Um, just putting some context here. So there are three primary ways of diagnosing EPI. Um, none of them are very convenient. So the first is the fecal elastase one test. Um, and that's because the, the concentration of this enzyme is, is five times higher in, in feces and is normally released when the pancreas um, isn't producing enough of its enzymatic activity. So this test shows that concentrations of under 200 is considered abnormal. However, um, mild symptomatic uh, EPI can be found between 100 and 200. So anything under 100 is really um, overt uh, pancreatic insufficiency. The other test is the coefficient of fat absorption, um, which assesses the, the percentage of fat absorbed through fecal matter over the course of uh, 72 hours. So um, the person has a very specific fat intake uh, over a period of time. Um, and that's how they're able to assess this percentage. Um, it is the gold standard. Uh, however, both of these are pretty uncommon in practice, um, especially with undiagnosed adults. When I say undiagnosed adults, I mean, um, let's say someone who has cystic fibrosis, for example, is developing um, uh, signs of pancreatic insufficiency. They haven't been diagnosed yet or, um, in those with uh, signs of acute pancreatitis or even late chronic pancreatitis, um, if they haven't already been diagnosed as a kid, it's unlikely that an adult is going to uh, perform either of these tests. Um, now, the last one is fecocomotrypsin, which is a, a product of, of pancreatic secretion found in the fecal matter. Um, this one is not as effective uh, because this, um, this product, it degrades during transit time uh, through the gut. Um, but, you know, if we're talking about someone with overt steatorrhea, uh, this would still be a positive result. Now, this is really where diagnosis happens because um, most of our job as dietitians is to ask pretty much all of these things. So, um, in my, in my clinical practice, uh, both in, in, um, in oncology and in cystic fibrosis and in outpatient um, GI, uh, dealing with folks with pancreatitis, um, you know, this became the reason why I would say to a doctor, hey, I think this person might have EPI. Um, well, why do you think that? Well, because they have overt steatorrhea. Um, I'm asking them uh, questions and the partner the partner's explaining that their, of the patient has malodorous stool and gas. When I say malodorous, I mean, like we're clear in a room here. Um, it, is, it is funny to the patient normally to talk about this, but, but truly when things are not absorbing the way that they need to, uh, that fermentation occurs, that, that maldigestion, malabsorption occurs, and the, the odor that can come from both stool and gas is, um, is distinct it's notable. And um, a lot of patients just kind of think, oh, I ate something wrong. But when it happens day after day after day or multiple times per meal, it's a clear clinical manifestation. Frequent loose bowel movements with or without steatorrhea, bloating and abdominal discomfort, um, signs of acid reflux or gastritis, uh, weight loss and malnutrition because fat is not being absorbed. Uh, subsequently, uh, deficiencies in vitamins A, D, E, and K. And because of um, these uh, uh, various deficiencies, there's a long-term changes in bone density, um, which is a long-term way of looking at pancreatic insufficiency in terms of, you know, monitoring bone health. But really, you know, it's looking at these GI symptoms. It's looking at things like weight loss and, and vitamin deficiencies that are the clear telltale signs of EPI. So we'll talk more about why cystic fibrosis um, is mentioned frequently throughout this. 
uh, presentation with other conditions, you know, that are not exactly related. We talk about pancreatitis, we talk about pancreatic cancer, all these different ideologies related to the pancreas. Um, CF, uh, these folks have the highest uh, incidence of EPI. Um, and even in those who were classified as pancreatic sufficient, they still might not have optimal pancreatic function uh, despite uh, at an earlier age um, having negative results for let's say the fecal elastase test, which is pretty common in the cystic fibrosis world. In unresectable pancreatic cancer, there's a 66 to 92% chance of EPI incidence. And that has more to do with where the tumor is located, how severe the tumor is, and if there was any treatment that impacted the, the status of the pancreas itself. Um, now, in, in, pancre in pancreatectomies, the EPI incidence is uh, again, different based on what part was cut off. So if it's the head, which is uh, where a lot of the pancreatic juices are released, we're talking about a 60% incidence in, this, in the distal region, 15 to 42%. Again, it depends on how much was removed. And in the central region, only about 10%. Now, uh, in chronic and acute pancreatitis, um, you, you might think that in chronic, the incidence would be higher than acute but the incidence of acute pancreatitis is short term. So the, the onset is so, is so significant that it has a high rate of causing temporary um, inhibition of these release of pancreatic juices. Whereas in chronic, um, the fibrosis and the inflammation is so long-term that it causes a, a less incidence, but a more severe long-term uh, EPI uh, association. So most people know about cystic fibrosis to be this um, mucus in the lungs. And though that's true, you know, the reason why we talk about that so much is because that is the primary um, cause of death in people with cystic fibrosis is, is, um, is uh, chronic pulmonary exacerbations, uh, lung infections, and failure. Um, CF is the most commonly occur occurring autosomal recessive disorder in Caucasians, it's actually more common amongst adults than children now, which is insane. And it's really only because more adults are living with cystic fibrosis than children living with cystic fibrosis. And that's because treatment and um, these genetic-based um, medications uh, extend the lifespan so much longer uh, than before. Um, you know, the lifespan used to be not even eight years old, and now we're looking at 40 years and beyond from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, which is truly amazing. So these medications that I'm talking about, they are all um, meant to correct the defect in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductase regulator gene. Doesn't matter if you remember that. The point is that that gene is responsible for regulating chloride transport. And because that chloride transport system is dysregulated, well, what follows chloride but sodium? And what follows sodium but fluid? So when this gene is, is, is defected, um, there are thick mucus secretions in every epithelial cell in the body. Now, there are a lot of epithelial cells in the lungs, which is again, the primary cause of death in cystic fibrosis. But really there are these epithelial cells all throughout the gut, in the GI and in the pancreas. So one of the etiologies of, of EPI in cystic fibrosis is that this mucus basically rots the pancreas from the inside out, blocks the ducts that the pancreatic juices will be released in that carry the enzymes and cause long-term inflammation and fibrosis of the pancreas. Um, other nutrition concerns outside of EPI for people with cystic fibrosis include malnutrition related to really high caloric needs, um, GI concerns, uh, again, aside from the pancreatic insufficiency, distal intestinal obstructive uh, syndrome, cystic fibrosis related diabetes, and cystic fibrosis related liver disease. So a lot of things going on with these patients nutritionally. The main uh, medical nutrition therapy is to maintain a Cystic Fibrosis Foundation recommended BMI levels. For males, uh, these levels are 23, and for females, it's 22. The reason why it's higher for males is because of um, the increased weight of the likelihood of males having muscle mass. 
um, you know, this is just a standard that is um, what's being used clinically um, in nearly every CF clinic across the country. Um, and though it's, although BMI is not the best tool, a higher BMI is positively associated with reduced lung infections and a reduced, um, and a reduced mortality rate per, I mean, a ton of studies. The recommended caloric intake is again, so much greater. Um, and so fat helps to meet this caloric demand, obviously because it has more calories per gram than, uh, than protein and carbohydrates combined. And so pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy is the solution to absorbing that extra fat. Um, I'll discuss more about PERT later on, but that is part of the MNT for these uh, individuals. PERT can, can be sometimes optimized using H2 blockers or, PP or, or proton pump inhibitors uh, because it neutralizes the, uh, the gut acid that might be enhanced when someone's on a higher fat diet. Um, obviously replacing that, those likelihood of those deficiencies with a fat soluble vitamin su supplementation, they actually make cystic fibrosis specific uh, vitamins that are, that, are that are water soluble versions of these fat soluble vitamins. Um, increasing sodium intake because sodium losses are so much greater because of that defect in that CFTR gene, and then drinking a ton of water and, and moving a lot to help expectorate that mucus in that lungs and move it through the GI tract so that um, we can prevent that uh, diose that I mentioned earlier. Now, in pancreatic cancer, obviously the etiologies are so much different. This has more to do with that tumor. And so um, EPI can really be moderate to extreme in, se in severity based on all of those things. So um, as I said before, treatment or destruction of normal tissue from, uh, from the location of the tumor can all be a causation towards EPI. Uh, the degree of obstruction related to the tumor, inflammation, or, um, or damage from treatment can also inhibit the release of those pancreatic juices. So even if those pancreatic juices are being made and those enzymes are able to be released, sometimes they're not able to get out because of this inflammation or because of it's being physically blocked. And then obviously surgical loss of tissue is a reason why EPI might exist. Um, now, because most of, because a lot of the enzymatic activity happens from the head of the pancreas, um, we see a gradual diminishing um, of, of enzymatic secretion as cancer spreads from the head and on uh, because there's less and less opportunities for there to be any enzymatic activity whatsoever. Now the MNT for these folks um, is a little bit convoluted because we have to understand that most people who are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer are um, have unresectable uh, metastatic disease, 80 to 90%. And that's because symptoms are not overt of pancreatic cancer. So it's caught so much later than, than other cancers. Um, so because of this, palliative care is actually more commonplace. Now we know that palliative care is not hospice, right? Palliative care is really meant to uh, improve quality of life uh, resolve GI complaints, which are which are significantly associated with uh, with quality of life, um, and make sure the person has what they need to carry on any palliative treatment that they might be undergoing. You know, this person might have metastatic disease and might ha might ha might have an unresectable tumor. That doesn't mean they can't be on a low dose chemo for the rest of their life. That could potentially extend their life for another 10, 15, even five or two years of quality life, and that's important. So early treatment of EPI is what's shown to be the most effective in improving quality of life and reducing malnutrition risk. We don't want malnutrition to already happen when these, um, when these folks are receiving treatment because that can uh, negatively impact the side effects of treatment. The more, um, the more someone goes into, into, the, into the malnutrition range, the, the worse whatever treatment they're on gets whether it be radiation, whether it be chemotherapy, um, and the side effects can range. I mean, we, you could have very, very, very mild nausea to severe, uh, you know, unretractable nausea and vomiting. 
um, you might have pudding stools every now and then to having um, chronic diarrhea. So really preventing malnutrition can help significantly improve quality of life, secondary to preventing the exacerbation of those side effects from treatment. And we do this again, through adequate caloric intake of protein, fats, and carbohydrates, absorbing those macronutrients using pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Again, hydration because they're on treatment. Of course, you know everybody needs to hydrate, but if you're on treatment, you're so much more likely to be dehydrated. Um, and that could mask symptoms such as you know, diarrhea if the person's not hydrated enough and they're experiencing constipation. Um, and of course, managing any other nutrition related symptoms um, of treatment or that the person might just have because they're a person and people are multifactorial. No one's, you know, no one lives in a, in a silo. Now with pancreatitis, acute pancreatitis can occur uh, because of a loss of functional capacity, of loss of functional capacity due to tissue death, also known as necrosis. It could be a loss of, of specifically a pancreatic functional tissue, not death, but a loss of, of the tissue. Um, and that tissue is called parenchyma. It could be related to uh, temporary ductal outlet obstruction or alterations in hormone mediators that are responsible for enzymatic release. Now, EPI is less common than um, uh, in, in acute pancreatitis than in chronic pancreatitis um, because overall because the higher incidence is is within that first six months, as I said before. Um, over the course of, of, 12, of 12 months and beyond, that incidence decreases to 15 to 20%. So a lot less at that point than in chronic pancreatitis. Um, and as the, as the pancreas uh, resolves, then the incidence of EPI obviously reduces. With that said, it's still important, for, oh, it's still important to to give these folks with acute pancreatitis pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy because the pancreas doesn't know that you're introducing these outside enzymes. It's not like insulin, where if you give insulin, you're not using the pancreas's insulin, right? In, in pancreatitis, the pancreas is going, to release, is going to release the enzymes that it can release, but if it can't, you bring in the backup soldiers the, the exogenous pancreatic enzymes to fill the role. Now, because the pancreas doesn't know that, that you're throwing in these exogenous pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, it's still gonna to continue to try to heal and produce enzymes and release enzymes so that when it does, you can slowly taper off the enzymes that you would give exogenously. And that's really a trial by fire situation. That's really, um, uh, something that takes experience and clinical practice and understanding uh, the, uh, the, the patient and having a good relationship with that patient so that you can discuss all of the previously mentioned uh, clinical manifestations to understand when you can start drawing back exogenous enzymes. What happens if there's too many enzymes in the gut? Well, if that happens, those enzymes just leave through the fecal matter. They don't get activated. Um, there's no damage done. There's no harm done. So if you're overlapping enzymes between what the pancreas is able to produce and what you're giving exogenously, all you're doing is going to maximize absorption. And then the remainder will again, exit through the fecal matter. Now, chronic pancreatitis is different because this is characterized by ongoing pathological inflammation. This eventually leads to fibrosis and damage and a loss of complete exocrine function and also perhaps endocrine function. So for that reason, type two diabetes might be the first indicator of chronic pancreatitis. And because of that, it's like two sides of the same coin. So in this situation, if there is a loss of endocrine function, this increases the likelihood of loss of exocrine function and specifically this pancreatic insufficiency. So risk factors, um, that can cause exocrine pancreatic insufficiency in chronic pancreatitis is chronic alcohol use. Now, research shows that chronic alcohol use is exacerbated by chronic tobacco use. Shocker, right? There's another risk factor for EPI in chronic pancreatitis, which is this PRSS1 gene mutation. So not 
similar to the uh, cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductase regulator gene, this PRSS1 gene mutation causes pancreatic insufficiency out for a whole nother reason altogether that's found in folks with chronic pancreatitis. Now, because a fecal elastase um, might not be an effective test in people with EPI and chronic pancreatitis, that coefficient of fat absorption might be a more reliable test. But again, it's just hard to get those tests in adults. So most of the time we, we recognize and treat EPI based on clinical manifestations, not necessarily on a diagnostic test. The MNT for pancreatitis in general is to continue diagnostic testing. So if you are able to test the patient and the patient complies, then you wanna, and, and the person is diagnosed inpatient, you want to continue testing after discharge every three months, especially if the person has acute pancreatitis, because then you can hopefully in this scenario, again, if the person's compliant, this is a perfect world here, you're seeing a, an improvement in the results every three months, and then you can use that information to taper away your pancreatic enzyme replacement. Because of the increased risk of malnutrition and malabsorption, um, we want to use that PERT, as I said before, and as, and as I also said before, that FE, that, um, that FE1 test can range between 100 and 200 um, because it's, it's, it's deficient, but it might not show up in diagnostic testing for that reason. It would just depend on how sensitive the test is. Again, the acid reducing medications, and again, meeting the, the standard calorie protein needs for that person. Um, now in acute pancreatitis, like super acute pancreatitis, maybe less than one week, seven to 10 days, um, a short-term low fat diet may subside the clinical manifestations if your request for PERT is denied or your recommendations for PERT is denied. There's no harm in giving PERT as soon as you recognize clinical manifestations, but you know we're not the ones who have the prescription pads. So if it's declined, again, that short-term low-fat diet will be applicable. However, keep in mind, if, this, if, this, um, if these manifestations last longer than seven to 10 days, if the inflammation lasts longer than seven to 10 days, then what you're gonna have is the increased risk of malnutrition uh, as time progresses. So we really do not want to push this short term or, or, or this, low t this low fat diet, except for in the short term, because you're going to be risking a lot of those um, essential fatty acid deficiencies, uh, risking fat soluble vitamin deficiencies, and things like that. Um, so it's not just about the presence of clinical manifestations. Let's talk more about PERT. So if you can see to the image to the right, um, PERT, is PERT is those little tiny beads located inside of that capsule. That capsule does nothing but carry the pills or carry the beads into the lower gut. So, well, the upper gut rather, the upper intestines. Um, so um, children even open these caps up and dump them into applesauce, for instance, to, to take their enzymes that way when they can't swallow a pill. Heck, I even had some people with pancreatic cancer be unable to swallow a pill because well, I don't know, they're, they're grown adults and they can't swallow pills, I don't know. But we would do the same thing, open up the capsule and pour out the beads. Uh, these, these enzymes come in various different sizes. So um, there's ranges from 3000 lipase units per, uh, per pill, all the way up to 40,000 lipase units per meal. Now you might think 40,000 sounds like a lot, but your body's releasing hundreds of thousands, millions of enzymes every time that we eat. Enzymatic production occurs when we start thinking about food. So 3,000 is meant for a kid. Uh, I mean, I would have, a, I would have a, a patient with cystic fibrosis on sometimes three, four of the 40,000s uh, per meal. And again, so these, uh, these dosage recommendations are based on the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation criteria because most people with EPI have cystic fibrosis. That range is 500 to 2,500 lipase units per kilogram per meal, not to exceed 10,000 per day because the long-term overuse may lead 
to something called, called fibrosing colonopathy, which um, you could all guess what that is, fibrosing of parts of the colon. Now, this occurrence is uh, less than 2% of people who were on long-term um, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy of over 10,000 units per kilogram per day. So it's not a common side effect. So some, some GI doctors and I have gotten into uh, friendly discussions about um, this fibrosing colonopathy thing. And the, and the deal is, yes, it's a risk, but there are way more risks with someone being on chemotherapy, but this, uh, this risk is so much lower, less than 2%. Um, now, with this said, when you get this, when you do your math uh, using 500 to 2,500 life base units per kilogram per meal, you might wonder, well, how do I, where do I start? What a big range. You know, I used, honestly, you're shooting a dart at the wall and hoping for the best. Um, I always start clinically, me, my practice, about a thousand and just start there because these dosage guidelines are meant for kids and adults. Um, so I'm not gonna start at 500 because it's going to be probable you're gonna have to increase anyway. So for me, my practice, not an official uh, recommendation from anybody, I like to start at a thousand and work my way up. Obviously the higher doses, the higher doses are made like the 40,000 for instance, or 36,000 or what have you, um, are made in order to reduce pill burden. So that if you get a number such as, you know, 140,000 light pace units for this meal, you can only give a few pills instead of giving, you know, two handfuls of a 12,000 or 15,000 light pace unit um, pert. It, I didn't mention this, but it's important to, to mention that the reason why the enzyme brands exist that are prescription are because they were FDA approved in the 90s. These enzymes used to not be FDA approved, just like there's all the enzymes you can find in GNC, in your local pharmacy, heck, in the grocery store. So those enzymes, like any other supplement, are not FDA regulated. When the FDA approved medications were not FDA regulated, they had the same problems, which were inconsistency in dosage. They were unsafe because you didn't know how, how many were in there. And so if you think you're giving, let's say 140,000, you weren't guaranteed that. So you might actually only be giving 100 and then maldigestion and malnutrition ensues. So it's really important if we're talking about pancreatic insufficiency, we are giving FDA approved pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, not over-the-counter lipase. Now, from the dietitian's perspective, let's go through how we would look at a patient. So we are talking about assessing clinical manifestations. It's not easy to talk to patients about their clinical manifestations. No one wants to talk about their stool or their gas, especially females. Um, why do I say especially females? Because in my clinical practice, there has been, um, you know, giggles and discomfort. And, you know, I just find that for some reason, males are more comfortable talking about their gas. Um, however, my point is that you want to find ways to get this information. Talk to the partner about how bad things might smell. Like, oh, does, your, does the patient pass gas in front of you? How does it smell? And that, that partner will be more likely to tell you how ungodly it is than the patient. One thing that the patient, um, that a lot of patients say, patients especially with a, a history of, of GI issues, um, especially, especially people of color. Uh, and I say that because people of color often have an increased risk of having lactose sensitivity. So you might speak with somebody of color who is so, so used to having lactose sensitivity that they're like, oh, diarrhea is fine. So my, my stools are fine. Everything's fine. I don't know what you're talking about. Because to them, stools, having loose stools and having, um, having malodorous gas, secondary to lactose, um, uh, lactose absorption problems is commonplace. So making the person understand that what you're looking for and what you're asking about is not commonplace. Their symptoms are not fine, not normal, and they can be fixed. Checking for those acid reflux symptoms. So 
you know, a person might not say, oh, I have acid reflux, obviously, but inquiring about, you know, acidic bellies or burning of the throat or anything that could lead to that um, and seeing if those symptoms, any of these symptoms get worse when they eat fat. Um, you know, oh, you had mac and cheese. Did you have diarrhea afterwards? Oh yeah, within five minutes. Well, I think you got EPI. Um, or, oh, I ate, you know, a grilled chicken breast and some broccoli and I had no, I don't have, I don't have steatorrhea. I don't have diarrhea. Well, no wonder you didn't eat no fat. So, you know, taking somebody off of the fat diet is going to show you that they don't have EPI, but in fact they do, they're not eating any fat to exacerbate the symptoms. Monitor that weight monitor that lean body mass. We know that the body impedance analysis and DEXA scans are great ways of monitoring lean muscle and fat mass. So um, obviously uh, weight is more than just weight, especially if we're talking about people with uh, pancreatic cancer, they might also have peritoneal disease. They might also have uh, edema. People with cystic fibrosis might have a temporary state of bloat from, having, from being on long-term steroid use similar to people with pancreatitis. So BI, um, BMI is not a great way to monitor these folks. We wanna look at what their, uh, their fat-free mass is and their fat mass is. Some labs uh, can be useful, especially when we look at um, you know, C-reactive protein and things like that. Um, vitamin D might be a good indicator for fat soluble vitamin deficiency. However, most people are low anyway. So if you have that patient that's taking supplementation, let's say they're taking uh, 2,000 units every day of vitamin D3. If their levels aren't going up in six months, that might be a sign. It's not the only sign, of course, but it might help you lead to where you're trying to get in terms of understanding this person's clinical status. When we're talking about nutrition diagnoses, um, it's important to kind of wrap together the different etiologies into this to better understand kind of how to solve the problem in a way that hopefully eventually we can get paid for. So ultra GI function related to excrement pancreatic insufficiency as evidenced by complaints of steatorrhea. Un unintentional weight loss related to GI complaints as evidenced by reported noncompliance to PERT. Severe malnutrition related to insufficient protein calorie intake as evidenced by 15% unintentional weight loss over six months and undesirable food choices related to food nutrition related knowledge deficit as evidenced by ongoing GI complaints consistent with EPI. This is, this is our, our, do, our domain as dietitians. You know, we're not doctors, we're not diagnosing EPI, but we can certainly tell that doctor that we think it's going on and have a nutrition diagnosis associated with it that doesn't get anybody in trouble and doesn't, rough any and doesn't ruffle any feathers. When we look at EPI in general, common threads that we can find for medical nutrition therapy include normal or greater than normal uh, caloric needs, especially to combat malnutrition, especially if intake is poor. PERT that may or may not be taken with acid reducing medication, hydration and exercise for a variety of reasons, as we mentioned before, you know, hydration and exercise is important in oncology, it's important in pancreatitis, and it's important in cystic fibrosis. Following up with the dietitian is essential. I saw my cystic fibrosis patients every three months, every year, regularly with phone calls and emails in between. I saw my oncology patients every two to three weeks, especially if they had pancreatic uh, cancer. I might even see them weekly, depending on their state of malnutrition. So following up with that patient is important. It, you, it's not all practices are prepared for that level of appointments. And not all of us have the ability to see our patients that frequently because our books are full, we're understaffed, and there's not a lot of funding to hire more dietitians. I know I'm preaching to the choir. However, advocating for these follow-ups as much as possible is essential. Um, getting the patients on your books, convincing that uh, oncologist or that pulmonologist or whomever, that gastroenterologist, that they need to see you as often as they're seeing their, their, their specialty provider is what's going to help maintain their nutrition status, prevent malnutrition risk, 
optimize absorption, optimize nutrition, and coincide well with their medical plan. So to wrap this up, and we're leaving plenty of time for questions, EPI is most prevalent in diseases such as cystic fibrosis, pancreatic cancer, and pancreatitis. The dietitian plays an essential role in the diagnosis of EPI due to the assessment of clinical manifestations. Malnutrition and fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies are commonplace and should be addressed clinically. Recommending appropriate pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy is essential and can essentially resolve EPI symptoms, which is fantastic. And quality of life is intrinsically tied to reduction of EPI symptoms, especially if you have someone who is under palliative care. Those are some key references that you can take a screenshot of if you like. A lot of the other information about cystic fibrosis you can find on the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation website just for, uh, just to mention that. And you can connect with me in all of these various ways. Um, the first link is my website. The second is my Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and finally uh, LinkedIn. So um, I see, Jamie, should I just get right into questions? Yeah, go for it. I'm happy to help facilitate. Just as a reminder for everyone, use that Q&A function. You can also use the chat function if you prefer to submit any questions that you have for Zachary. And thank you. This is amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So our first question comes from Mary. So Mary asks for acute pancreatitis, PERT should be given whether or not they've been diagnosed with EPI since the diagnostic test might most likely won't be done. Does it matter if it's acute, moderate, or severe? So in acute pancreatitis, um, a diagnostic test will probably not be given, but it may, depending on the practice. Because it's unlikely that the test is going to be done, you're assessing for uh, for clinical manifestations. And so um, it, the, the, the first moment you see overt steatorrhea or overt clinical manifestations of EPI, there is no harm in giving PERT, no matter if it's two, three, four, five days into the onset of the pancreatitis. Now, with that said, um, if, it's, if, if you're assessing for clinical manifestations and you don't see anything, or you see some small signs, but not enough to convince you that, that the person's ready to be on pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Like for instance, they have some acid reflux, they have some bloating, and that's pretty much it. Again, that could be enough for EPI. I'm telling you, it doesn't have to be this over, you know, blowing diarrhea and gas and all of that. It can just be acid reflux and bloating and a, not even weight loss. If you decide, you know, now is not the time for PERT right now because of all the hoops I have to go through to get this patient to be on PERT. And by the time I get it for them, they're going to be discharged. It happens all the time. Um, and you follow up in three to four days and the person has worse symptoms, then maybe you want to give PERT. Uh, because again, we don't want to go more than seven to 10 days with this person being on a low fat diet just to offset their symptoms. Um, the slides will be available. Um, I think Jamie mentioned that she was going to be posting yep. them uh, on, online somewhere. Jamie, yeah, so we'll share a recording of the full session um, and that will be in your inboxes shortly. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. Great, any other questions from, oh, we got one, here we go, from Sean. Yesterday I had a pancreatic, so yesterday I had a pancreatitis patient, three weeks status post gastric sleeve with 44 pounds of weight loss. Could rapid weight loss have contributed to pancreatitis? Absolutely. And I'll tell you why. So onset or um, contributing inflammation from any gastric surgery is a contributing factor to excrement pancreatic insufficiency. Absolutely. It's very, it, the prevalence isn't as common as pancreatitis, CF, and, cancer, and pancreatic cancer. So I didn't mention that in the presentation, but absolutely. Gastric sleeve surgeries, gastric bypass surgeries, just because you're putting your hands up in that person, you're moving things around, you're removing parts of the, of the GI, that systemic inflammation can occur and can block that pancreatic duct temporarily and contribute to this, uh, to this weight loss. Um, you know, sleeve patients don't lose weight as, as quickly as people 
with uh, with bypass because they have more uh, more absor- more room to absorb in the stomach, pretty much. And so, um, forty four pounds is is quite a bit. So I would say that that might have been contributed by um, by pan- uh, by by at, at the very least temporary pancreatic insufficiency. Great. Well, I, I don't know if Zachary, there's any um, last comments or um, FAQs that you typically get you want to um, share with everyone. You've provided some great resources. Again, everyone can access those. Oh, we've got another question. Perfect. <laughs> but I was going to say access those via the recording once uh, sent out, but I'll leave this question to you. So um, this person says that uh, I found the I found my experience I found your experiences with females being more embarrassed by talking with bowel movements disturbances interesting as a female dietitian I've had the opposite experience of males seeming more uncomfortable uh, discussing GI concerns in females uh, possibly to the gender related pheno- a phenomenon that we could be sensitive to that's very possible absolutely um, <laughs> I think that's funny too absolutely. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I get asked a lot is, you know, I think, I think often as dietitians, we feel inhibited by stepping on um, doctor's toes and we don't really know our place when it comes to EPI because we can't diagnose, but we might know what's best. And so I refer to GI all the time when I had patients who, um, uh, who I felt had EPI. And I would not only write the note and tag the, and tag the physician, I would email the physician and let them know. And then I would chat box <laughs> their physician assistant or their nurse to say, hey, there's this patient I want on your radar. Like I was putting these patients in front of the doctors in a way because when it comes down to it, these patients' nutrition relies on us because we are the gate holders to understanding EPIs, clinical manifestations, only because that provider is looking at the grander picture. They might not be looking for EPI specifically. You know, they're trying to, they're trying to work with pancreatic cancer, you know, in some of these folks. So EPI isn't on their, isn't the front of their radar. So it's really our job to be that ancillary service to help assist in that, in that treatment, um, in the treatment related uh, portion of care. Am I familiar with uh, symptoms related to precancerous uh, pancreatic cysts? Um, any dietary implications? So only if the cysts are, it, are blocking a duct or causing inflammation in the head is where it would be related to pancreatic insufficiency, right? So if the cyst is precancerous and is towards the tail, it's very unlikely that person's going to have chances of EPI. But if you're seeing anybody with any pancreatic problem, there's no issue in doing the nutrition assessment for EPI, just in case. Um, you know, some enzyme companies are having commercials now, encouraging people to assess themselves with the symptoms. So I feel that we should really be the first people to ask them these questions rather than themselves, because we're the ones who know how to assess those, those answers to those questions for EPI. What is my experience in using Reliazorb with, with these patient populations? So for those who don't know, uh, Reliazorb is a cartridge that clicks into um, tube feeding um, along the tube between the, 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 uh, the bag where the formula is held in the closed system, or I guess open system even, and the gut. So it's external to the body and the cartridge contains enzymes, the formula goes through the cartridge, touches all the enzymes, gets broken down, has the amylase and lipase and and protease bound to these enzymes, and then it goes into the gut, so the gut doesn't have to do anything to absorb, and the person essentially doesn't have to take oral pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Again, this is only for people with uh, with enteral tube feedings. So um, it's amazing. I love Relizor. Now, it's a brand. Um, they're, the, they're the only one that makes something like that. Um, I have found that a cartridge can last up to a liter of formula, though I think the indication for it is slightly different. And oddly enough, putting two cartridges together reduces the absorption. Um, 
which I don't understand why. And I've talked to Relizer about that myself, actually, and they don't understand why either, but it's what the science shows. It's what their science shows, actually. So I think Relizer can be a really great tool when used as a single cartridge with up to a liter of formula. And really, if you're getting up once to change out the cartridge, as opposed to getting up, you know, after every Tetra pack that you might put in, which is what you'd have to do without Relizorb, your quality of life is still improved. And the next question is, in a patient with diagnosed with acute pancreatitis, awaiting biopsy results, there's a mass in the pancreas, having lost 10% weight in three weeks, not on enzymes, not able to tolerate much in the way of food. That could be, enz that could be pancreatic insufficiency right there. Um, when you're mentioning toleration of, of food, you know, that says to me right there that there could be a slurry of symptoms associated with EPI that um, not only is backed up by this weight loss, but might also be ameliorated by temporary enzymes. Um, you know, if you're part of a hospital system that has a cystic fibrosis care clinic, a lot of those folks have um, samples of enzymes in their, in their office. So if, they're, if you have a good relationship with your CF dietitian, they might be able to you know, lend you some samples um, that, you could get, uh, that you could use under the doctor's permission to trial on the patient and see if they work. If you're in a GI clinic or you're in a pancreatic cancer center um, or an oncology center that sees people with pancreatic cancer, you can talk to your rep um, for uh, Creon, which is one of the enzymes, Zenpep, which is another one of the enzymes, um, Pertzi, which is another one of the enzymes, and get samples brought in and trial them on your patient prior to having to write that prescription. For me, samples were essential. I use those samples for every single patient that I, that I assessed to have manifestations of EPI. And I did that uh, because I wasn't going to wait for the doctors to assess them, to discuss whether or not they would do a diagnostic test, to then get a prescription so the person can then fill it now we're, you know, a week out or more, and the person's only getting closer to malnutrition, reduced quality of life, uh, worsening symptoms, um, the whole slurry of things. So for me, I would definitely uh, keep samples if I'm someone who's assessing people for EPI for that reason. Uh, I'll skip just to the next question. Um, uh, it's about tube feeding. So uh, in a a person with EPI on enteral feeds, would a peptide formula be used without the use of pancreatic enzymes? The answer is no, only because peptide formulas have broken down protein, not broken down fat. And so that person still needs enzymes to help absorb. Also, peptides aren't completely necessarily, um, well, I guess, yeah, the carbohydrates and the, and the fats are not broken down. So even if the protein is, uh, the person could still be having symptoms of EPI. Uh, another question, SIBO can cause uh, foul smelling stools, gas, bloating, uh, deficiencies, and other digestive symptoms. Is there an easy way to differentiate between SIBO and EPI? Well, there's a SIBO test. So um, the SIBO test is a whole lot easier than a, than a fecal elastase test. So ruling out SIBO is important. Um, and if for some reason that SIBO test is going to take two to three weeks, starting temporary uh, enzymes is not going to hurt, hurt anything, even if it is a SIBO and not EPI. Terrific. I'm glad everyone uh, got less shy and had a ton of Me questions too. for you. No surprise. You are a wealth of knowledge, Zachary. We're really grateful to be working with you. Um, stay tuned, everyone. We are going to be hosting another event with um, Zachary uh, about EPI uh, with a partner, AbV, on May 27th. You all will get more details, um, but hopefully we will see you all there. Um, there was someone who raised their hand. Louisa, I hope um, you were able to submit your question and get that answered. Um, if not, hopefully Zachary's resources um, will help you find the info you're looking for. And with that, right on time. I love it. Thank you again, Zachary. We're really grateful for your time and expertise. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Everyone as well, too. And thank you for, for joining me this evening. I really appreciate it. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.